uh, dear uh, colleagues, friends, brothers and sisters, and sisters in every part of the world, wherever you are, whenever you are, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And I am praying for all of you to have a safe living wherever you are, especially with being surrounded by the uh, awkward pandemic of COVID-19 and with the new strain of maybe COVID-20 or COVID-21. I pray for all of you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be protecting you and making you having a very prosperous and stable and tranquil life and having serenity in your soul and spirit. Today we'll be talking about the subject which we discussed uh, on Tuesday in Arabic about Syria and the crisis in Syria. And the title of my talk is Forgive Us Syria. Forgive Us Syria, we could be the real criminals. I'm talking about myself, we could be the real criminals. Let me first to thank my colleagues who are actually helping me, Ahmad Sheikh, who prepared the material, as well as uh, Ali Shawa and Mehmet Yusuf, who made the uh, uh, slideshow. Uh, before we start today, tonight, I would like to take you back to the journey of the contribution of the Syrian people to civilization globally, across the history of humanity. The people lived in this area, they contributed heavily, positively, to all civilization created from this area. And to different kinds of renaissance happened to this area, and different subjects in life, like science and technology, literacy, poetry, uh, arts, drama. So those people are extremely rich in culture and in history. So please, we should not demean the value of their contribution or devalue their contribution to humanity and to civilization which have been living in the past with us. Amongst us, those individuals who deny such contribution and sometimes look down at them and at the people living in Iraq or other places, those individuals who are doing that are really ignorant, narrow-minded, stupid individuals do not know what they are talking about, about a great, a great nation from the city of Aleppo, from the city of uh, uh, from the city of Damascus and other major cities, actually, which created such civilization and such culture and such renaissance, not only for the Syrian and the Sham people, but actually for the whole humanity. He's just trying to pay my respect and my honor to this nation or these people. My talk today, I put the index in front of you. If you can use the Zoom, please use the Zoom link. The introduction, demography of the northwest of Syria, summary of humanitarian needs in northwest of Syria during 2020, reasons behind the failure of any social change and movement fighting corruption. Uh, who is who is responsible? Who are responsible for the Syrian crisis? The philosophy behind my new idea to find the solution, steps towards solution and conclusion and message. In the introduction, as you can see it on the slide, this conflict happened on 15th March, 2011. Spontaneous, unplanned, popular movement or demonstrations aiming to ask for more freedom space, more civil liberty space for the people, more social justice. And such demonstration was widely spread all over the country in a, in, a, in a rocket time. Unfortunately, the central government did not deal with it according to the needs of the people, but they used what we call it a heavy-handed response 
excessive response, which changed such a peaceful demonstration into armed conflict, as we have seen it over the last 10 years. After uh, uh, accusing the demonstrator of being terrorists, extremists, radicals, a lot of imprisonment, a lot of torture, a lot of killing, whatever we call it, as we have seen it over the last 10 years. And this is not only my opinion, this is the opinion of most of the humanitarian organizations working in Syria as a whole, whether it is in the northwest of Syria or is in different areas. According to the United Nations records and other humanitarian organization as well. Uh, in many United Nations reports, many, many, not only United, many, it said or mentioned that the majority of the Syrian people are living under the poverty level. Living under the poverty level, they used to live in dignity. In dignity. In dignity. Where millions of people are in dire need for financial and social support to rebuild their lives again and to retain their dignity again and again. This armed conflict imprisonment, internal displacement inside Syria, led to an emergence of new psychological problem. New psychological problems which need from us another humanitarian response called psychosocial support scheme. So food, water, normal medical uh, uh, response, uh, shelter, the traditional ones. Now we need also psychosocial support to those millions, millions of people. As mentioned by UN agencies, as well as humanitarian agencies reports. UN OCHA, which is the coordinating body of UN, mentioned also that 11.7 million people need immediate need, immediate need, immediate need of support, need of immediate support and protection, protection. They are not safe. The people are not safe to live in certain area in Syria. 11.7 million people are not safe to live there. Three million people have moved to the northwest of Syria, become internally displaced people. Half of them have been on the move more than once from this place to this place to this place to this place. Also, the six million people inside Syria are internally displaced. And five, six million people are refugees in the neighboring countries such as Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. Talking about a huge number of internal influx of displacement and the external influx of refugees moving outside the country. In about 15, 16 million are on the move internally and externally. United Nations Secretary General uh, uh, Antonio Guterres mentioned on 13 uh, March 2020 this statement. That the number of injured and the dead Syrian people are unknown and not counted for. And it's another huge disaster and calamity that we don't know how many people are injured, so they need uh, treatment, and how many people are dead. Not counted for. It's not me who said that. It is the SG of United Nations, Antonio Guterres, last year. This diagram, which in front of you, show the demography of the Northwest Syria, okay? The original population in this area was 2.2 million. And you can imagine with less available social services for those 2.2 million, they have received extra 2 million people. So the total number of population in this area is 4.2 million people using the facilities for 2.2 and less million people. Very, very disastrous, very disastrous. 
and definitely the humanitarian organization, including UN agency, cannot cope with this. Also, there is 73,000 people, refugees, Iraqi and Palestinians. So 73 refugees, 73,000 refugees, plus 2, 2, 2 million and 89,000 uh, 89, displaced in this area. Let's talk about the children. The children under the age of five living in this area is 702,000. The children in this area and between the age of five and 15 is 552,000. The children between 15 and 18 is 195,000 living there. So the total number of children under the age of 18 living in this area is over 1.4 million people, are more than 35% of the total population in the northwest of Syria. Disaster. With this 1.4 million children, what gloomy picture will be facing them in education, health, nutrition, and social welfare? What we expect to see those children in five, 10 years' time may be criminals, unfortunately. Unfortunately, unfortunately. The number of camps built in this area, in Syria, Northwest Syria, is 1,304 camps. You can see the uh, organization who prepared this report. 1,304 camps. The number of people living in these camps is 1,040,000. And uh, 48,000, 1 million and 48,000. And the number of randomly organized camp, randomly organized means that it is not related to United Nations or to big organization, haphazardly organized, is 393 uh, camps. And the number of people living in such camps is 187,000 people living and 393 camps in this area, apart from the 1,300. So you can imagine, you can imagine the catastrophe of how to manage such camps and such people with less resources with the organizations. Special cases within the community, like orphans, like widows, and like people with special needs. The number of orphans under the age of 18 in this area is nearly 200,000. Nearly 200,000. The number of people who with special needs, nearly 200,000 again. This is 199, the first one is 198. And the number of widows living in this area are 400 and uh, are, are 46. And 1,800, and nearly 47,000. So the total people in need in this area is nearly 470,000 people. So you can imagine the, the pressure on the local municipality, local organization, local civil society organization, and, and even the United Nations and the international organization. The birth rate in this area is 2.1, and the death rate is 5.6, which is near very high. The death rate is very high. Okay. Needs required, and how those people met their needs. These people met 59% of food required and uh, livelihood, only 59% of the people, of, of the needs. 46% of what they need of water and sanitation. 61% of health and nutrition. 56% of non-food items they met. 38% of protection, they cannot protect the whole population in this area. It's covering only 
Shelter is 44%. They cannot provide proper shelter to those people, only provided proper shelter to 44% of the total population in this area. Education, of course, catastrophe, 43%, and mostly, mostly primary education. This is what we look at, the humanitarian need and the deliverable to respond to such humanitarian needs in this area. When people from Syria went out on 15th of March, everybody had a dream. Yes, we would like to have more freedom, would like to have uh, more uh, civil liberty space, would like to have more social justice to build our future. We did, did not have any clue to what would be happening there. They went peacefully, but unfortunately, they lived through this agony, this agony in the last 10 years. And you can see the images of displacement or refugees. Next, please. After looking graphically at the material situation in the northwest of Syria as a case study, let me take you with me to why, why a lot of social movement would like to change the status quo in any country fails. Fail. Why? Why? As I mentioned earlier on, it was a spontaneous reaction of mass movement to the people. That's it. Reasons behind the failure of social change and movements fighting corruption are many. I'm mentioning those ones in front of you on the slide. Number one, naivety of the people. People are so kind. They think when they come out, everything will be rosy. Everything will be peacefully. An experience of the people who are trying to make the social change. They can believe that actually they have a just cause. But the way to apply or to call for implementing a just cause is not by just going out and demonstrating. Emotions, emotions as well. People getting excited, excited. And this was not the first time it happened there. It happened before 1982 in a city called Hama. This kind of a, a spontaneity, spontaneity, and unplanned reaction, any unplanned reaction, any unplanned action or reaction will never lead to social change. Any unplanned action or the action will never ever lead to social change at all and forever. Sometimes exclusivity, sometimes people who are calling for the social change are excluding others. It's not inclusivity, it's exclusivity. Exclusivity will never serve a social change. Hesitancy could be a leadership. Do not know where to go. To go to the north, to the west, to the south, to the east, to the northwest, northwest. We don't know. It's hesitant because there's no there's lack of experience and it's actually a spontaneous action. And people are hurrying up. They want to make the change like today, as I mentioned in the Arabic. I talk uh, on Tuesday, it can't be. Social change will never ever happen overnight. Even if you people make a revolution and become successful, by the time the people who will be in charge of such outcome, it will take them years, years, years to make the effective positive social change. And I give this example many times. If I marry someone and she is pregnant, I cannot take my child to school the time it came out of the womb of the mother. My child will have to be educated for 20 years to become a university graduate or second year graduate, whatever you call it, secondary year student graduate. Six years in our life. Why should we rushing? And don't 
put a high expectation. Don't put, put high expectation on the table. Not learning from the past, as I mentioned, many countries went through the social change, peacefully or through conflict. Learn from them. Because you will be responsible for the people coming out before they come out. Calculated response and calculated action. And the ability to build, to build the coalition. I think this piece I'm reading, I wrote on 16th, no, 26th of January 2014. Well, I'm reading that. I, 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 I wrote in Arabic and English at one of my posts. And I believe, how can I make a social change and I'm not making coalition with other organizations in the country, in the society? <coughs> Being biased toward my group, it's only my group, and this was killing any social change. My group is a group amongst many groups. Inclusivity has to be there. Exclusivity should not be there. Being biased to one group or to two groups. Not giving concession. I am working for my country, not for my organization, not for my political party, not more for my jama'a, not for my religious group. We are working objectively for one vision to make social change for the whole country, not for a district, not for a city, not for the capital, not for a society, not for a community. We have to give concession to one another. And this is what happened in South Africa and in Rwanda. In Rwanda, in less than one year, 950,000 people slaughtered in the cold blood conflict. Then now, look at Rwanda. Look at Rwanda. Look at when the Prophet ﷺ entered Mecca. And, and the Meccan people told them, what are you going to do with us? Our cousin said, go, you are free. Reconciliation. If you want to build a society, to build social movement, successful one, you have to reconcile, to learn how to reconcile and connect and co to cooperate with others. Lack of vision. People don't have vision. They can see things, but they cannot have the vision. They cannot formulate the vision as well as lack of leadership, particularly wise leadership. These 10 or 11 or 5 or 6 or 7 will be reasons for failing any social change, any positive social change. Those groups, I'm going to discuss this in this uh, uh, slide, are the responsible people for what's happening in Syria. Government organization, governments, international organization, a central government, civil society organization, influential groups and others. Slide. Slide, please. Who are responsible for the conflict in Syria and what are the suggested solutions? Responsibility will lie on those five groups inside any country, not only in Syria. First part, central, the government, which includes central government, transitional government in non-government controlled area, governments of neighboring countries who are having an interest inside Syria, in Syria itself, or inside any other country, regional powers and global powers. To the governments. This is the first group. The second group is the government organization, such as United Nations Organization, European Union, League of Arab States, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Cooperation, uh, International Justice Court, and others. Those, those two groups constitute 50 to 60 percent of the responsibility of finding a solution to such a problem. Unfortunately. The third group is the international organization, whether they are humanitarian, human rights organization, social and development organization, think tanks and research organization, media, advocacy, and others. Those also responsible 
is also responsible for such a conflict because actually they should be advocating more, promoting more, and connecting more to end the conflict in Syria. Group number four is the local civil society organization and the international civil society organization. It goes down to the local CIF, local civil, uh, CBOs, civil, uh, uh, local uh, community-based organization and community service organization. Even goes to this very local ones. Traditional and charitable organization, documentary, fear, organization love to do the documentation, whether actually by audio or by video or by uh, writing transcript. Syndicates, union, uh, platforms, forums, coalitions, and others. Social media, as well. I mentioned social media in all my talks. Platforms and organization, faith-based organization and religious organization, political parties, grouping of clans, uh, uh, tribes, uh, doctrine leadership, which is a religious also leadership, uh, and followers, sup even sporting clubs, even sporting clubs as well as community centers. So all those people sharing the responsibility, as well as sharing it with the government, with the government organization, with the international organization. Influential groups and leaders are also responsible because I am influential. I have followers. I have people who listen to me. I have people who respect me. Influential groups and individuals such as religious leaders and scholars, young activists and women, and you can see on the social media people followed by the tens of millions. Media journalists, personalities, and as well as talk show presenters, businessmen, investors, and economists who are interested, 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 in Syria as a cash cow for them. Traditional donors from among these organizations and individuals about traditional organizations, individuals and sympathizers, thinkers, public figures, and social role model, symbols and icons of arts, literature, drama, and other sports superstars like I've seen it with some of the superstar from the football and the others when you stood up for your Uyghur people and for Gaza and other places. Syrian diaspora or living in the West and the East and the North and the South. And the community organizations as well. Syrian citizens inside Syria, even some refugees and displaced people uh, there as well. The Arabs and Muslims are the Arab and Muslim diaspora and organization in the West as well. Icons and the stars of social media platforms. All those, if we find these five groups, we hold them responsible. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying the title of the talk was or is Forgive Me, Syria. I am the criminal. I'm having a part of the responsibility on my shoulder on my shoulder, as an individual, as an influential, as an organization, as a political leader, and the religious leader, economist, and, 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 journalist, and media. Coming back to remind you, I get of the target. The center is the central government and other governments, then followed by other governments, then followed by government organizations, then followed by other groups. As you can see, those people are responsible, responsible for us, and they have to be you have to be stand up for the responsibility. My idea today is to a little bit go away from the government and government organizations. And they say why. The philosophy behind the idea based on three basic principles. Number one, it should be Syrian initiatives of the Syrian inside Syria and Syrian outside Syria. It's initiative, serial made solution, number one. Number two, using the power of high tech, high information technology, social media platform, and civil society organization, particularly, particularly after what? After observing the continuous failure of governments and government organization, finding a reasonable solution for the problem. 
fake news. Governments are talking, 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 because, uh, because there is no much interest in them in finding a solution. Could be the interest of them is to take some part of the country as it has been happening somewhere else. The third basic principle, using the young people as the main driving force in implementing this course of action. Serial initiative, using the technology, civil society, and young people. These are the three basic principles. You can read it in the slides. While we speak now, when I'm speaking now, and other and other people speak, while we speak now, I may want while many thousands of Syrian people are suffering continuously from death, torture, injuries inside and outside the country, we discover that such governments, mostly foreign governments, are busy dealing with other problems because they have got too many problems. I'm not going to say that such government actually uh, they have their own internal problem, they have other problems, they have other interests as well. So they are not there for you people. That's why the solution has to be Syrian initiative. If the Syrian people, this is my call to you, are failing or fail to create a comprehensive, coordinated, complementary vision, 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 vision to come forward through this deadlock, the other governments and their government organizations who are extremely busy dealing with their internal affair and external problems will not be able to create the expected and required solution. And the Syrian problem will be like that of the Palestinian problem and the others. Because the, other gov the foreign governments have got too many problems on their plates. You are the only people who will be able to stand up, unite, and put the vision to find a solution, a solid solution on the Syrian ground. This is always happening in conflict zones and in areas where uh, natural born disasters and others uh, will find the internal displacement and influx of refugees, and to find people stay in this area for years and years and years, unfortunately. And the Syrian case is no difference to the other cases. People sometimes can see what I'm talking about is impractical and not feasible. Of course, you have the right to say anything about myself and they'll accept it. But this is what we have seen when dealing with other issues happening in different parts of the world. I'll give you examples. In Sudan, the Eritrean refugee there is nearly for 50 years. For 50 years. The Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. My first visit to their camps was in 1994-95, nearly 30 years ago, and they're still on the move, the Rohingya. The Somali refugees in Kenya, the DAP camp, you can see it, 20, the oldest camp in the area there. Palestinian refugees, as we can see it over Jordan and other countries. So, we are not talking, we are talking from experience, from knowledge. If you want a solution, you stand up for it and forget the differences, forget the sectarianism amongst us, forget the partyism, the partition. People are partitioning you, partitioning you amongst us. We have to prioritize. We have to prioritize. We have to prioritize what? The reliance on the capabilities and the initiative taken by whom? By the rights holder, the rights holders, and the need owners, ashab al-huquq, the need owners. 
not on the foreign government and foreign government organization. Prioritizing this, and this will never happen unless to sit down and to agree how can we put forward a vision for a comprehensive social uh, uh, solution for all of us. Let us learn how to live together inside and outside Syria, whether citizens, internally displaced, or refugees willing to go back to Syria. Let us, let us learn how to build this integrated Syrian society, integrated, integrated Syrian society. Let us regain Syrian social justice, human rights, fighting extremism amongst us, radicalism, terrorism, sectarianism, and corruption. These are there, whether we grow our beard or wear niqab or wear whatever you call it, it is there. It is there and we have to address it. We have to address it collectively through a comprehensive vision, not for one group, but for the whole country. Steps towards solution, four steps or five steps. I'm not going to talk about the role of governments which have been mentioned before and others, and we all know it. We all know it. But number one, I'm going to talk about to benefit from the in, to benefit from and intensify the process of communication. If we have got those numbers of people inside and outside Syria, and you can use the social media and others, they can themselves make the pressure group globally on everybody else. Benefiting from and intensifying the process of communication with all stakeholders through social media platform. This is number one. In the Arabic talk, somebody called me, social media is not going to be the solution. I said, okay, fine. It doesn't start anywhere. It doesn't start to make the pressure, to build the pressure, to build the momentum of the change. Number two, how can we build coalition with others? Why we divide ourselves? This group, this group, this group. Even, I don't want to talk about military conflict, but I'm talking dividing a nation into not societies, into smaller zones or clusters of people. Clusters of people will never be able to find a solution. Building coalition between different initiatives. Not only your initiative is right. We can put your initiative with my initiative and other initiative and discuss it, discuss it comprehensively looking forward for the one Syria, for the greater Syria. Number three, how to, to utilize our local, national, international civil society, and to have many now in different parts of the world, humanitarian organization, whether they are Syrian or international, human rights organization, as well as others. Utilize those. Look at road map, map your stakeholders. Keep mapping them and knowing them. Number four, benefiting from the immigrant, number the diaspora in the West, with the high tech and the knowledge and the technology. And don't let them to, I was visiting uh, Turkey, I, I think a few years ago. And you know, I found an organization was registered to respond to what? to the people who moved from a city in Syria to another area inside Syria. I'm, I'm not going to mention the name because I don't want to upset the people. This is wrong. It's not, the, it's, not, it's not for the people of Damascus. It's not for the people of Hams. It's not for the people of Hama or for the people of, of, uh, of, of Deir Zur or Hasaka or Idlib. It is for the Syrian. Because the people in the northwest of Syria are a mix of everybody. Are a mix of everybody, are a mix of everybody. Benefiting Syrian immigrant in turn, even benefiting from the refugees. So among the refugees are highly capable individuals can make the change to be empowered. And this is the role of the local civil society organization and the international civil society organization. Last and not least, lobbying pressure groups outside. 
the country. Think tanks, researchers, research institutions. We have to start somewhere. If governments and governments are failing us all the time, and millions of people are suffering on the day, on the hour, on the second, on the minute. In conclusion, and my message for all of you, especially to the young people, the solution has to be Syrian, based and led. Our solution should be socio-political and economical, not military. Our solution should be protected and guaranteed by the international community, but such international community do not become or does not become benefiting from any solution. Once they start benefiting, as we can see nowadays, the aims and objectives of the solution would be different. Today, we should listen to whom? To the voice of wisdom and wise people amongst us, amongst us, among the Syrian. When I said us, among the Syrian. Wise men and women amongst us must change the strategic thinking and objectively focus on one Syria, not on one region in Syria, on one Syria, one Syria. One nation. One nation, which is multicultural, multi-faith, multi-racial, and not sectarian, not racist, and justice for every citizen. I say it again. One nation, multicultural nation, multi-faith, multi-racial, not sectarian, not racist, discriminating, hardline, rigid society. Let us build a strategic social solution that can take Syria forward to build civil society sector and organization that can protect the dignity, credibility, freedom, liberty, and justice for every citizen, for every citizen, for every citizen, for every citizen. A solution is not depending on foreign aid and loan. We believe that in the Syrian are the only people who will find the effective and long-standing solution. We believe, I'm talking about myself, I could be wrong, I could be wrong. And you can say that this man is, is naive, have no experience, does not know what's what. Okay, fine, I have no problem. I am going to meet Allah with what I'm saying. A solution is not depending on foreign aid or loans. We believe that the Syrian are the only people who will find the effective and long-standing solution. And we are not going to give up, especially myself, building a social movement that can make the effective social change to continuously protect and develop our societies. This is my message for the end. The final message for all of us and this is the reminder, particularly to you young, young people, to you young people, those who want to build their country, have to prioritize the principles of forgiveness, reconciliation, complementarity, cooperation, and partnership. This is the priority. The priority for forgiveness, Reconciliation, complementarity, cooperation, and partnership. To what? To our desires, personal desires, our political party interests, the benefits of our clans, religious groups, or sects. Now, we have to make the priority, again, of forgiveness, reconciliation, complementarity, cooperation, and partnership to settle the dust. Once the dust settled, we'll be able to go to the second phase of establishing effective social justice in the country. 
this is something which I wrote the same day, 26th of January, 2014. Our nation unites us, does not divide us. We divide our nation, but our nation unites us. Our nation unites us and does not divide us, elevates us, promotes us, and does not lower us. To be built by us, okay? Not to be destroyed by us, to be loved by every one of us, and not to be hated by any one of us. This is our nation. Nation that we love, nation that we build, that will elevate us and this nation. If you have got this kind of sentimental relationship with your nation, with your culture, with your health uh, history, with your values, with the contribution of your people to humanity over the hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Our nation runs in our blood. See our blood. See this? Vein runs here. Runs here. Runs in our blood. Records our whispers for us so close to our hearts. Draws our dream to create our glory. Our nation runs in our blood. Record our whispers. Draws our dreams to create our glory. This is our nation. Talk about. And last but not least, it's not enough to live inside your country. But our country has to live inside us. If we have this feeling towards Syria, towards Yemen, towards Iraq, towards Egypt, towards any country on earth, we'll be able to bring social justice, freedom, civil liberty space, white civil and others. So I take this opportunity to thank you and to pray for our people and brothers and sisters in Syria and have been suffering badly over the last 10 years. That's why I'm calling myself, I could be the criminal of failing such wonderful people, such credible, integrity, uh, integral people who contributed heavily to the development of humanity, civilization, building Renaissance from this space of land. This is my apology to you, Syria, and to the people of Syria at the beginning of the 20, uh, 21 uh, year against COVID. We are not going to sit down and let COVID drive us, but it will drive COVID with our precaution. Measures. Inshallah, next week, inshallah, the talk could be talking about the definition of director and manager, the difference between a director and manager, the difference between director and manager. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for uh, being with us today. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.